<laughs> hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. We're all doing our best to stay healthy right now, but what if said illness was forced upon you? Social distancing or not, tonight you catch the scare bug with a little story that I like to call Death by Proxy. My family is diseased. That is, my family suffers from a recurrent disorder that has affected nearly every one of us, impacting generations. My older brother and I were very close. He was a little more than four years older than I was, but never seemed to resent spending time with his younger brother. He had helped me learn to ride a bike, how to make a sandwich, and many other notable milestones of childhood. When I was about six, Alan, my older brother, got very sick. At first, it seemed as though he had a common flu, and I assumed that he would be better soon. I don't even think he knew the full extent of his condition. A few weeks went past, I playing in the backyard by myself, Alan not getting any better. I tried to spend as much time with him as I could, but that didn't last long. Mom would force me out of the room earlier and earlier each day, telling me that I had to let Alan get his rest. Pretty soon, I was barely spending any time with him at all. I was barely allowed to see him at all. Once, I tried to sneak him in a candy bar, his skin pale and gray, his eyes surrounded by dark, purplish circles, like he had been given two black eyes. His epidermis sagged, from bones beneath, showing the fat and muscle was being eaten away. The doctor that had seen Alan couldn't explain the ideology of whatever was causing his symptoms. He prescribed him something pretty generic from what I understand, and my mother fed that medicine to him every day until the day he died. I'll never forget that day. My father died years beforehand in a bad car wreck. I was really broken up when Alan finally passed on, but I think Mom took it harder than I did. Mom didn't leave her room for nearly a week, except for that of making me meals amidst sobbing about the kitchen. One day, though, Mom seemed to be significantly happier than the previous day, as if her grief had nearly been lifted overnight. That's when I thought that maybe things would get better. I mean, I missed my older brother, and nothing was going to change that, but I recoiled at the thoughts of losing my mother to overwhelming sadness as well. Although the days began to glimmer with a sense of hope for the future, it was short-lived. After a few days, I began to take ill. It started with vomiting and soreness in my joints. When I told my mom about how I was feeling, I dreaded the fear that would be in her eyes given the recent death in the family. Tears did indeed run from my mother's eyes as she drove me to the doctors that evening. Her hands trembled from what I figured to be fear. But there was something else about her presence that I could not place a finger on an element neither crestfallen nor rageful. Once again, the doctor couldn't find a single thing wrong with me. He assured my mother that I would feel better soon, that it was seemingly just a stomach bug, and that I should be better within the next few days. The man prescribed me some antibiotics that my mother would have to fill on the way home, at the local CVS in town. When she pulled into the lot, I unbuckled to get out and follow her inside, 
but I didn't even make it completely out of the car before vomit exploded from my pharynx and collided with the pavement below with a slap. I was forced to stay in the car and wait while she went inside. I swear she must have been in there for close to an hour. I figured at first that maybe it was just busy, but as I looked around the parking lot, I realized it to be only half full of its parking capacity. Whatever was taking her so long certainly didn't involve a mass surge of customers. I found out later, after she had returned and I had inquired, that she had been talking to one of my teachers about my condition. Condition? I remembered thinking. The doctor said it was only a bug, nothing more. I reminded her of this, to which she replied, Yeah, th that's what I said. With that statement, Mom started the engine, before carefully backing out of place and making way for home. I just wanted to get to my bed. A fleeting, yet grim reminder of Alan's last days flashed through my mind. It's just a bug. I reminded myself over and over again all the way home. Once we had arrived, Mom was more than helpful in assisting me into the house and helping me to bed. She promptly prepared and delivered me a bowl of steaming soup before returning to the living room and making a few phone calls immediately afterward. I figured that, whatever the doctor had prescribed me, Mom had mixed into the soup, because the steamy chicken broth brought with it another smell, separate from that of bouillon and preservatives. Something more like camphor, and that expected medicine-type smell. A hint of it could be detected when the hot liquid graced the papilla of my tongue. There was a slight, nearly unidentifiable burning in my throat when I swallowed, something I attributed to the searing heat of the soup itself. When I had polished off the bowl, it wasn't long after that I passed out. Mom must have come in while I was unconscious, because the empty bowl was missing from the table beside my bed, something I didn't notice right away, due to the intense pain and lack of illumination. I opened my mouth to scream, but a call for my mother was not what passed my lips. I yelled for Alan. Even I was surprised, agony or not. Why did I call for him? Did I forget? only for a moment that he was dead? My second cry was for my mother, but it wasn't likely necessary. Her footsteps through the corridor on the other side of my bedroom door could be heard making their approach as I yelled out for her. Again, as if I had no control at all, my projectile vomited across the length of the comforter, draped across the lower half of my body. I instantly rejoiced in my mind expecting the relief that usually accompanies post-regurgitation. The pain grew, and I clutched at my abdomen, doubling over in pain. My door burst open just before the light switched on. In the doorway stood my mother. But it was what else the light had revealed that astonished me. I could have swore that I saw Alan with a terrified, sorrowful look on his face, his hand extended out and reaching for me from the corner of the room nearest the door. But then I winced in pain, and when I reopened my eyes, he was gone. I was sure that if I said anything to her, that my mother would just figure it to be a delusion or hallucination facilitated by illness and subsequent fever. And at the time, that's what I determined it to be as well. I was young, but even at that age, I assumed his vision to be the product of cognitive correlations between my current circumstances, the memories of my brother, and his suffering. My mom rushed to my side and helped me to get into the shower, just down the hall. I really didn't feel like moving. The sensation in my gut was like that of a thousand knives, piercing my gastric lining all at once. 
while I cleaned myself as best I could beneath the running shower head, my mom replaced the bedding in my room, preparing it for my return. Once done and dressed, she escorted me back down the hall and into my room. I instantly noticed the oddly colored fluid inside a tall glass, beside the newly made bed, covers turned down in invitation. Mom practically pushed me into bed before covering me over with clean blankets and placing the glass in my hand. You sip that, honey. It'll make you feel better. I'm gonna go get the thermometer, she told me. And with that, she gave me a smirk and a kiss on the cheek before walking through the door on her way to retrieve the thermometer. I stared into the cloudy liquid contained within the glass. I began to lift it slowly towards my lips, and just before the rim of it graced them, the glass was seemingly torn from my hand, yanked free to spill across the newly placed covers as it rolled onto the floor, shattering into pieces. I sat in shock, my eyes grown wide in confusion. What the hell just happened? It was as if something undetected had tried to swipe it from my hand. Maybe I was delirious. Maybe I simply had lost control and fumbled through the glass. But that's not how it felt. I was still in a state of disequilibrium when my mother returned to my room. She entered the room saying something about bed rest. When she stopped short in the middle of her sentence, her eyes focused upon my blankets and then the shattered glass on the floor. It wasn't my fault. I... She hit me. She didn't even let me finish before walking over and striking me. She started in on how I needed to take whatever it was that she gave me, that it was critical that I take my medicine. I tried to explain to her that it wasn't my fault, but her frustration persisted. At that moment, I figured she was angry about having to change out my covers for a second time. It was after she replaced them again and brought me a replacement glass of clouded fluid. She seemed to revert back to her calmness. I took the glass from her hand and held it in my grasp. I allowed her to kiss me on the cheek goodnight before she assured me that she would be back in to check on me in a while to make sure I was feeling okay. She was apparently planning on waiting up as she left the light on and proceeded down the hall and down the stairs, signified by the sounds of her descending and creaking steps. I reached out for my drink and noticed the hairs on my arms standing on end. It was late spring and not that cold inside, or out, but still, an icy chill drafted across my skin like breath, causing a small spasm to run up my spine, resulting in a slight shiver. Before I could shrug it off, I could have sworn I heard my brother, Alan, say something to me. It seemed like a garbled jumble of whispers, but the cadence of his voice was easily detected. I figured I was delirious, that maybe I should hastily down the glass of drink that my mother had procured. I extended my arm further, and just as the glass flew off the table by itself, like it somehow jumped from the stand, or an invisible force had pushed it. Alan? I got no response from the air around me, but I could hear my mother approaching the stairwell from the level below. The room was the only portion of our house affected by the hall's illumination that was still creeping past the door jamb and into my bedroom floor. I could hear my mom begin taking the stairs as I recognized the black silhouette standing inside my doorway. I was still assuming hallucination because Alan could not be there. But despite rationality and logic, the shadowy outline of his body gave me a tilt of the head in assurance and walked off in the direction of the stairs. I listened intently, actually waiting to discover whether or not Mom would see him too. The thought, even then, seemed ridiculous, and I was just about to give up on the notion completely when I heard a shriek from my mother. Silenced just before the sound of something 
a heavy tumbling down the stairs until stopping at what I assumed to be the first floor. I listened. Listened for any sound at all. From my mother or my brother's ghost. When I heard nothing, I began calling out for them both. I would continue my shouting for a long while before sitting in silence and awaiting the light of day. Once daylight did arrive, I left the confines of my room to locate the phone in my mom's room down the hall. First, however, I proceeded to the opposite direction to confirm my obvious assumptions. Mom was lying in a crumpled, broken mess, head turned to the side, laying on her stomach, left leg bent in an unnatural way, and a vacant stare frozen in place on her motionless expression. She was dead. The coroner later confirmed that she had fallen down the stairs, breaking many bones in her body, including two cervical vertebrae. I was admitted to the hospital for treatment of my condition. Both the staff and I were astonished to find out that my mother had been poisoning me. I passed through the foster care system, got a decent paying job, and eventually started a family of my own. My beloved wife passed on early into our marriage. When I first explained that my family had a generational disease, I meant it. You see, my mother was diagnosed with Munchausen by proxy disorder, a psychological disease in which the outside party inflicts undue illness on someone else in order to gain indirect attention. Something that has apparently been passed down to me. Something that will likely transcend to my son, provided he lives that long. Well, if bed rest and good medicine don't make you well, homicide might help. And don't forget to stop by again next weekend to take your medicine with a large dose of terror. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again like the flu again next Saturday. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!